Um, yeah, so within the report, we were reviewing what, what data gaps there are and, and within the existing literature, what, what was missing um, and what is there. Uh, and with remittances in particular, I mean, there's a lot known about financial remittances. I mean, it's the same with um, the international financial remittances. So this is the same with international migrants as well. So we're aware, as Christian just mentioned, that 3% of the population is meant to be engaged in migration. Um, this is 213 million people. Um, we're able to account for these because these are official statistics. Um, but again, we, we can say that this is going to be a largely an underestimate because it's not accounting for those undocumented migrants in particular. Um, and this is the same as well for internal migration and internal remittances. It's, it's, it's much harder to track, so we, we don't have that information there. Um, but no doubt considerable, especially considering the fact that for internal migrants, there's 763 million people estimated to be engaged in internal migration, meaning um, migrating within their own country. Um, but also what we don't know much about is with remittances in particular, not only do we know um, about financial remittances, but there's also different forms of remittances. So you have in-kind remittances, so that's the transfer of goods between people, as well as social remittances, which is the, the exchange of knowledge and ideas. So we reflect upon these in the report, and I won't go into detail now, but, um, but these, these are, again, uh, areas that, that deserve a lot more research, especially because of the impacts they might have on people's livelihoods. Um, from my own uh, experience of financial remittances, um, my husband's from China. We, we sent uh, money back to China and invested in a factory uh, randomly. Um, I'm not sure what the use of that factory is, but uh, as just an example, I mean, you again might have examples yourself of where you've sent uh, money back to your families for various reasons or purposes. But the financial remittances that are sent globally are considerable. It's estimated 436 billion US dollars were transferred internationally um, for various reasons. Uh, that's triple that of overseas development assistance, so ODA, that's, that's triple that. Um, so of course this has huge implications for, for economies, for alleviating poverty, and, and this hasn't gone unnoticed. It's been acknowledged in since around 2006, uh, the importance of remittances. So they, they focused in central debates um, around migration and development. However, within these debates, forests are largely missing. And this can be said for forests as well. Um, when we talk about forests and, and, and largely, in, we, we make overgeneralizations about migration or it's, or it's missing completely. So it's not, it's not considered. Um, but those remittances received by households offer an array of options, whether for household consumption, substituting agricultural practices, and hiring labourers. Um, but positive relationships between mig migrants, um, remittances, and forests have increasingly been recognised, and that's namely through the forest transition uh, theory. So forest transition refers to forest recovery, so that's whether it's managed, unmanaged, successional, or intentionally planted forest. Um, it's found that also with migration, uh, a pullback in labor associated with migration has produced more forest, albeit with less biodiversity. Um, in other instances with remittances, it's been shown to intensify agriculture, and this may or may not have positive outcomes for forests, um, but may, uh, but depending on different contexts and different factors and the availability of alternative livelihood strategies. Um, live, livestock production is also another investment people may make um, and also will have profound impacts for forest cover. Livestock requires low labour demands and can function as an asset, so therefore may be a, 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 an attractive um, option for people. And studies have found that international migration um, has related positively to increases in livestock investments. Um, the impact of remittances on forests depends, like I just said, on a number of factors and how investments are made um, is often difficult to assess, especially at a landscape level. Um, but where we do know that um, data and knowledge is, is lacking is especially in these microdynamics, especially between households. Um, and so where we may be able to my, uh, 
where people may migrate or choose to migrate or choose to send remittance and how much and those implications for forests um, is still largely unknown but will be mediated by a number of socio socio-cultural factors and um, I'll, I'll lead on now to Bimbika who will tell you more about the issues of gender and age. Um, thank you very much Annie and Christine. <coughs> Um, so, globally, women make up about half of all migrants, um, but actually there are a lot of regional variations. In Asia in particular, um, much, of, much of migrants are skewed towards men. It's, um, it's actually the, the aggregate figure for Asia is actually 60%. But in certain countries, which um, have historically and increasingly been migrant um, sending countries, the figures are even more skewed. Um, and I'm originally from Nepal, and um, migration in Nepal is one of the major contributors of the GDP. Uh, and it's actually only 6% uh, of migrants who are women. Um, so there's, um, um, and similarly in other countries where we're hoping to do research, like in Tajikistan, um, it's mostly the men who migrate. Uh, there are a number of factors which explain that, and the intensity of um, which factors are more important depends on the context in which we're talking about. Um, but they're related to um, uh, government policies. So in Nepal, for instance, the government had actively um, uh, resisted the migration of women. Um, they're related to household and communal dynamics, and they're related to market forces. In other words, the type of labor that is demanded. Um, and the type of opportunities that are available, the channels that exist as well. So, and the age dimension is also very interesting. Um, so globally, uh, migrants generally come from a pool of 20 to 64 percent, 64 years of age. That's actually 74 percent of the um, of migrants are from that age pool. And um, between 30 to 39 years, that's where uh, migrants are concentrated. And so I, I thought that these dynamics were really interesting, and I w had the opportunity to explore some of this in, in my research. So the um, research in Nepal, in the middle of, um, of, of the country, where I was looking at community forestry and how people collectively governed resources, uh, forest resources. So I, I got an opportunity to un understand what the implications of feminization of agriculture uh, with the men largely leaving for migration was ha having on forests and on the women themselves, and also um, the geri geriatrification of rural areas. So um, land and labor being primarily left to old people because the young and abled men in particular were migrating. Um, interestingly, in terms of forest policy in Nepal, um, there's a paradox, um, like Christine and Annie mentioned, migration is hardly mentioned at all. And when it is mentioned, it is seen as a negative thing, as something, a, a deterrent to collective action. Um, but at the same time, it is argued or it is implicitly assumed uh, that women benefit from men being away. So women can play a larger role in forest management uh, uh, when, when men are away. Um, but in my research, I actually found that migration, male out migration in particular, was a, a disempowering process for women for various reasons, for contrasting reasons, in fact. So in one of the communities I was studying, uh, I found that migration, male migration provided space uh, for, for women to come together and collectively govern resources. But at the same time, um, it did little to change the dynamics between um, the user groups and the forest officials who they relied on for various reasons, such as registering the forest, uh, for getting access to resources such as seedlings, and also trainings and um, community development activities that the forest uh, bureaucracy was providing. Um, so, um, uh, so, men, uh, so women, despite the fact that they were governing the resources collectively, they still had to rely on men who were largely absent to mediate between themselves and forest officials. Um, and in another context, um, I, I uh, actually found that migration was leading to a consolidation of power and, and privilege and decision making amongst uh, senior and powerful men in, in the community that I was studying. 
Um, so women were present in forest user group committees, for instance, but they were only participating very nominally, and they didn't really have a, a, an influence, a voice in, how, in the type of decisions that were eventually made. And you could see that in terms of the rules that the uh, forest, uh, forest user groups um, uh, implemented uh, in terms of how much access uh, women were able to get for fuel wood collection, for, for other necessities that they had with, with the forest. Um, um, so in general, um, the impact of migration and, and remittance and uh, the different trends and trajectories that they are, um, they are influencing are very little studied and, and uh, I think the Nepal case study provides a good example for why we need to dig a bit deeper. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. And just to finish up, I'd like to mention that th this paper, which is a, 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 a cons includes considerable amounts of data, and it con con uh, also are, are summaries of considerable amounts of data, and includes both some sort of hints at very, very interesting case studies, also tries to get to bring all of these together to actually talk about what are the salient trends, what are the salient sort of changes and trends that are occurring that are linking rural to urban to transnational, what their impacts are on communities, on the both urban and rural communities at this point, and how those are linked to the various kinds of forest transitions. So we expect that this paper will be published quite soon, and we hope to have an impact, especially because we feel that, A, sort of highlighting the fact of that, there has, that the data that are available to us at this point are often collected in ways and presented in ways that makes it difficult to include those in, in discussions of what's going on with forests. We hope that this will spur uh, different kinds of data collection, the insertion of questions about migration, about the complexities of migration trends into various types of, of uh, data collecting um, and, uh, and data, and data uh, summary um, processes. Uh, secondly, we really hope to, to spur uh, whether national governments or others, to actually try to understand how those remittances, for instance, can in some ways be, be, um, be harnessed in order to actually promote both the well-being of, of communities that depend on forests and also the well-being of, of the forests in which they depend. Um, remittances, as, as Annie has point out, pointed out, are a very special, very special kind of, of cash flow or a very special kind of flow of resources that go into these communities. It's not one in which we actually have to worry about whether it's reaching the people uh, to, that it's supposed to benefit because it's their money. So um, we hope to, to also work with projects. We hope to build these kinds of information into projects. We hope to influence policymakers so that the benefits of migration um, are actually captured by the people who are migrating, by the people who need these kinds of, of, um, of uh, resources, but also in the end actually also benefit the forest. So um, now I'd like to thank our speakers and I'd like to, again, to open it up to any kind of discussion or questions that you may have. Thanks very much. Uh, I have uh, two questions. The first one is, I wonder how, uh, how if it was possible in the, in the different case study also to link migration with uh, adaptation. If you had any, because at least for uh, a lot of countries in Africa, we have a clear trend that there is migration as an adaptive strategy. That is what's happening at the local level, but at the national or the international level, we have these alarmist discourses about all the migrants who will come and all these numbers who actually didn't happen. And uh, I think also to the question to the livestock and gender, there is a link also to adaptation because it's clear that in Africa at least, there is a trend to invest more in livestock 
from remittances, but specifically in uh, small ruminants who have a different impact on forest. And this is also because there is a gender shift in the livestock, so that women now are taking more responsibilities in the livestock sector, and their cultural position or their preferences are more in the, in the small ruminant. So these, these things are like linked adaptation, gender, livestock, and migration. And I wonder if you have some, some information about these complex linkages. Thank you. Maybe Annie wants to. Um, yeah, I mean, we, d we did, you know, in, in, in the vastness of the literature we, we were looking at, I mean, there, there, we have a section in the report as, that sort of emphasize it, emphasizes this case in terms of the uh, fast onset environmental change and migration. It's something that hits the headlines is, is something people are more aware of and sort of these, these mass movements of people, whereas often, you know, some of the slow onset of migration is often... Um, shadowed by that perhaps. Um, I mean we do have a section as well that, that talks about um, the environment and, and forests as buffers um, so for, for climate change adaptation so I can't remember the, the exact study site but it was yeah it was uh, where, where forest was used as, um, as a barrier for tsunami in, in, in these types of um, situations but I mean I we have some more details in the report, but yeah, uh, we, we cover that in general. But I don't know if maybe you could say more about the gender side. Um, I think that's a really important question. And I think that also demonstrates um, the importance of doing this exercise in the first place, that there, is, there are these um, data or um, gaps in knowledge. And ex exploring the questions or the issues that you've outlined are really important. Um, uh, we, didn't, we certainly, in our review, didn't find a study that focused specifically on, on the issues that you raise. I should say that we found quite a, we, we, uh, we found both some literature and also some interesting questions that address not only climate change adaptation but also climate change mitigation. For instance, in the issue of remittances um, that are going into these communities and what the effect may be, for instance, on PES, the, the effectiveness of PES payments, the effectiveness of red schemes, for example. So these are issues that that have been raised to some extent. But again, um, like with many of the, of the systematic reviews that are done, um, in the end we also do come up with a call for more research on these issues. So in many cases we're not so much summarizing, we are trying to summarize what's known, but we're also pointing out the enormous gaps that continue to exist. Um, thank you. There's documented evidence that macroeconomic shocks can have uh, dramatic effects on migration trends. And, and C4 has done some research in the past on how uh, in Cameroon and Indonesia on this, on this effect. Um, my question has to do with whether there is any evidence um, of the effect of the recent global recession on migration and also remissions, and whether this is going to be uh, part of what you'll be discussing in, in your article. Um, well, I just, uh, I mean, I don't know if we have that, those exact case studies that you mentioned, but yeah, I mean, I think it was highlighted in the report that, yeah, that um, despite, despite all these the economic crisis and everything that's been happening, uh, recently um, that that hasn't actually affected remittances which again goes to show the strength of, 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 of what remittances are and what they mean for development so um, yeah so that it seems not to have impacted so far for the remittance flows which is interesting in itself but again what we know internally we, we're not sure so um, again that's just international and what, what, what's been documented but as for those informal flows we, we still don't know but sorry I don't know if that quite answers um, actually, during the financial crisis, there was a lot of discussion around precisely the issue of macroeconomic or, or depressions or uh, slumps and their impact on remittance. And there was a lot of forecast that that would have a very negative impact on remittances and the number of people who are employed. Um, but actually, um, recent studies have shown that the, there has been an impact, but the intensity hasn't been as much as was initially expected. I must say that we're also, I think, 
we as a group also just recently uh, wrote a research proposal to examine some of these issues in, um, in the field. Um, one of the countries that we're hoping to work in is Tajikistan, which gets 52% of its GDP from remittances, and most of the migrants are in Russia or in Kazakhstan, and with this enormous economic slump in Russia, it's something that we actually hope to, uh, to look at while we're in the field. Um, it, I, I just wanted to say, because I sort of missed saying it when I, when I um, summed up, but we talk about remittances, but there's also an enormous pool of savings, diaspora savings, which is, I think, another area that we may, may well want to think about when we talk about sort of, you know, making use of financial flows for, for uh, forestry issues and all that, that, um, you know, projects that may actually help to help to uh, facilitate some kind of use of diaspora savings and remittances for forestry projects, I think might have a great, um, a great potential. Oh, it was you. No, somebody here. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I guess it's very complex kind of issues and uh, data set, I, I imagine. I'm just wondering if you differentiate the, the level of skill of these migrating people and what would that uh, what would be the impact of the origin, uh, the, the condition in, in forest sector of the origin place? Um, yeah, no, I think that's a re really interesting uh, point and a question that people sh should look into. As, as I mentioned, the, the, the difference between what we have for the international compared to what data that is available internally and sometimes that's there's, there's so many gaps and in the incompatibility that it's hard to compare across countries but within a country these are things to look at and, and also bearing in mind a household may have a member who's involved in international migration internal migration uh, rural to rural rural to urban so there's all these different um, migration pathways that can be uh, the household could be engaged in some way or shape or form simultaneously. So, so the, I, th I think that, yeah, exactly your question is, is, is what we need to think about because you need to, again, to, to move away from these simplistic motions of just someone moving away, but more about what these different impacts and what these different movements mean for the, for the household and livelihood strategies. Um, why there's no a single man in your team? <laughs> um, I, I just want to ask you if you could help me with a problem I'm having. And I'm trying to find more information about the feminization of forests and forestry, uh, which is very difficult to do. To find the, some case studies information, the bushmeat work that we do in Peru in the area of Ucayali shows a lot of different changes, not just people moving and landscaping transitions, but different ways how the whole uh, managing forests, the whole ways of making decisions are being changes, uh, and, and gender has a lot of things to do there. Um, I wonder if you can help me with this literature on feminization of forests and forestry or forest related activities. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'd be happy to because those are some of the issues that I work on myself. I, I think um, what is important to highlight is that generally when, uh, when people talk about feminization of forestry or feminization of rural development, these are, these are trends that we can see. So for instance, if you were to look at um, employment rates in, in um, agriculture, they've been going down, but they've been going down a lot more for men than they have been for women. Um, so you can see that feminization occurs, but there's a very, that's, that's a manifestation of, of a trend, but it's not necessarily a manifestation of what happens thereof. So what happens to management? What happens to inequalities? Um, sometimes the word feminization lumps everything together, um, the trend with, with the practice, the um, results. If I may just, if I just may add a little bit, I think generally what, we're, what we find is 
this, this complexity. And I mean, I think in many of our, many of the questions that people ask, we find what seem to be contradictory statements. You know, migration leads to, to empowerment of women, migration leads to disempowerment of women, migration leads to more forests, fewer forests, better forests, more degraded forests. And it's, it's obviously there are very complex things going on and there are a tremendous number of mediating factors. So it sort of behooves us to figure out what all of those, me what at least some of the most important mediating factors are of how people start treating forests in different ways or the different people who then get access to forests. So I should say, you know, I think that uh, the paper does bring together a tremendous amount of that literature. It tends to not offer any simple answers, but we also do, I think one of the important things that I think we do do is that we identify a lot of the gaps and a lot of the, the areas where the contradiction may seem like a contradiction, but with somewhat better data and with somewhat more, somewhat more better research, we can show what, that, that these are real insights and that there are ways also uh, that, that there are policy implications of this, of how, how with some, some, some changes, how with some facilitation and all, these, these outcomes can actually change. Christine, actually, you, you answered somehow the, the question I was uh, going to ask about this <coughs> generalization, specifically relating to the gender impact of migration. And I wonder if you find some studies who challenge this view of uh, women are kind of victims of uh, migration, because our work in northern Mali showed actually very, very mixed outcomes. It depends also which woman are we talking about, uh, how was their role in the society before, and then how is their, their, their work, their relation to forest, how much are, are they before involved in forest and after the migration. So I think that, for example, in Northern Mali, we found out that women were for, before not doing uh, charcoal activities. And when men migrate, they, they engaged in charcoal activities. And the women who engaged in charcoal activities, actually their life or their income increased, and also their involvement in local institutions regarding forest. They have some issues with foresters, yes, because they need, but that is, that is a change, a social change happening there. And we cannot say it's negative or positive in a general way. We have to look at the context. Mm. Great. Well, I see no more hands up. And so I'd like to thank our, our two speakers or our, our little trio here. I mean. <laughs>